Our guest today is truly a pioneer in science. He's been leading new excavations deep, I mean really deep, into caves in South Africa. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to understand and witness the power of science um, and what it can tell us about our origins, our place in the world, um, and where we might be going in the future. And making this program even more special, we're joined not only by fellow New York students, but we're also streaming live so we can interact with students around the world, making this truly a global experience. In our audience, we have students from all over New York City. So let's make some noise, okay? The Brooklyn Latin School. <laughs> the Bronx Center for Science and Mathematics. <laughs> and High School for Environmental Studies. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I understand that you've all been learning about our leading paleoanthropologist here today, Lee Berger, these past few weeks. And I hope that's inspired you to learn more about science in general and about human evolution specifically. Just like other scientists, paleoanthropologists use data, in our case fossils, in order to test hypotheses about human origins and how we got here, what our ancestors ate, and what their interactions were with the environment around them in the very deep past. Most of you, or most of us, at one point have wished that we had a time machine, you know, like Mr. Peabody's time machine. I mean, how many of you who have wished that you could go back in time? Anybody? Yeah. 100 years? 1,000 years? Million years? <laughs> Well, you'd have to go back even farther than that if you wanted to actually witness human origins. Every human fossil we find, no matter how small, a bit of a bone, a tooth, especially a tooth, is a piece in the human evolution puzzle. And while they're all very, very important, it's not very often, not every day, not every year, that we find fossils that are so important that they can change the way we view the human family tree. Lucy did that, Don Johansson and his colleagues, more than 40 years ago helped us understand that walking on two feet came before growing our big brains. And now our guest today, Lee Berger, is doing this again with his colleagues. Right now, I mean like right now. <laughs> These fossils are being excavated and analyzed right now, and they're only just beginning to be analyzed. So we have, we have no idea, we can only imagine what it's, they are going to tell us about ourselves and our place in the world. They can change the way uh, we see the world and our place in it. So I won't keep going. I know you're all very excited to meet our pioneer, so we're very happy today to be joined by Lee Berger. The entrance to this South African cave is a doorway to the ancient past, perhaps to the very dawn of humanity. Here's the half of the skull that we're going to be collecting right now. This is the top of the skull. Led by paleoanthropologist Lee Berger, an international team of researchers is investigating a treasure trove of one of the rarest and most sought after objects on Earth, fossil evidence of early humans. It's the richest early hominid site discovered in the history of the search for human origins on the continent of Africa. So rich that the whole excavation was documented in real time by the National Geographic Society. It took a highly specialized team of petite female researchers to navigate the dangerous squeeze into the main fossil chamber and recover these priceless artifacts. Making sense of them all will take years of study and analysis, but that doesn't worry Lee Berger. Don't tell anyone, but it's not really work. It's my passion, it's my hobby. I live to do what I do. 
he found the roots of that passion growing up in rural Georgia. I had always had this fascination with the outdoors. I would collected rocks, I would collected Native American artifacts like arrowheads and stuff. By the time I was I read to go to college, I had thousands of artifacts that I'd collected and assembled and, and cataloged. He was an Eagle Scout and president of the Georgia 4-H. I spent all my time outdoors. But you know, when you get older, you're kind of pushed towards convention. And after high school graduation, conventional wisdom led him to study pre-law at Vanderbilt University. Absolutely hated it. Confused, he ended up dropping out of school. And I'd come back and had basically walked out of college for no reason other than I wasn't doing what I love. But after working for a while at a local TV station, he gave it another try. I found a little university that I could afford called Georgia Southern University. And there I met these most extraordinary professors. And they turned me on to this concept of how you could make a career as a working scientist. And at the same time, I read a book called Lucy. And that was the beginning of my drive to get into paleoanthropology and to get to Africa. Donald Johansson's best-selling book about the discovery in Ethiopia of fossil remains of an early hominid called Lucy inspired Berger's imagination so much that he actually called Johansson up on the phone. And I said, I understand you're coming to uh, Savannah to speak, and I was wondering if you wanted to stay at my parents' beach house instead of a hotel. And he said, sure. The famous paleoanthropologist and the young student hit it off immediately, and Johansson arranged for Berger to attend the Harvard Kubi Fora Field School in Kenya. And this is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in Africa to find fossils. And on my first morning, I couldn't even sleep. And I got up early, 4.30 in the morning, and there was a light on in the mess tent. And there was a man I met, and he started talking to me. He said, you know what? No one's going to get up for a while. You want to go with me? I'm going to go survey another area just after sunrise. And uh, I said, you know, of course I do. And he and I went out, and I had the most transformational morning of my entire life. And as we were walking back, we were 100 meters from the Land Rover, and I looked down, and there was a femur of an early hominid. My first morning on a site in Africa, I had found one of the rarest sought after objects on the planet, one of these early hominids. Finally doing what he loved, Berger excelled at it. He moved on to graduate studies and later a faculty position at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa, just a short drive from the high plains west of Johannesburg that are known as the cradle of humankind the world's richest, most explored early hominid site. He began using GPS satellite data and Google Earth to try and identify new fossil areas to study. That became an addiction of mine. I almost vanished from work going out and surveying. On a 2008 survey trip to the Valley of Malapa, he took his nine-year-old son Matthew with him. Matthew said, Dad, I found a fossil. I could see him kneeling down with a rock. I realized that his and my life were going to change forever. Because sitting in the side of that rock he was holding, I could see from five meters away a hominid clavicle. I turned it over, and there on the back was a jaw and a canine coming out of this rock. I was holding perhaps the rarest thing we can find, a partial skeleton. Excavations revealed one of the most spectacular finds in history. Eventually, we would have up to six skeletons lying on the surface at this site I would call Malapa. And in 2010, we named a new species, Australopithecus sediva. It was big news around the world, and even the subject of a 60 Minutes report. There's a face from 1.9 million years ago. How old is Moses? <laughs> a few thousand years. The new species may help illuminate the mysterious evolutionary gap between ape and human. And the rock that preserved the fossils also preserved organic matter like food particles lodged between 1.9 million year old teeth. Most remarkably, researchers think they've identified fossil hominid skin as well, the oldest ever found. It was the richest find in the history of the search for human origins on the continent of Africa. Good luck. Until yep. now. Hopefully in the next few hours, this skull, which is now 30 meters underground, be seen on the surface in the science tent. Berger's November 2013 excavation at the Rising Star Cave in the Cradle of Humankind <laughs> uncovered more than 1,200 elements of dozens of individuals, 
only painstaking analysis can tell us what species this is and where it fits on our family tree. There will be work for hundreds and thousands of scientists on every aspect of anatomy because this isn't going to be the last discovery. We're going to find more. I guarantee that. Well, welcome, Dr. Berger. Um, you can see our New York participants here, but um, joining us uh, via Google Hangouts, we have some other participants, some students from Vestimmerland's uh, Gymnasium in Ars, Denmark, and a very special surprise for you, uh -huh. Lee Berger's own high school oh, in wow. Georgia, Screven oh, County High School. Oh, hello, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, isn't that awesome? So um, uh, before Dr. Berg takes your comments, he's going to talk a little bit uh, to us about the important work he does. Maybe you want to start by telling us uh, how you uh, chose the malapocyte and why you had your son in the field with you to begin with. Sure. You know, that was an extraordinary time for me. Um, back in uh, 2008, we were actually looking at closing down exploration for these fossils. I was at in South Africa. It's hard to imagine now, but the world was moving in a sort of different direction of exploration. I bet you want to adjust this. Yes. <laughs> right there. He has to buy me dinner after this. <laughs> oh, okay, super. There we go. Thank you. And at that time, the idea that we discovered pretty much everything in this field uh, was prevalent. The idea that there was nothing left to be found, that these were the rarest sought after objects on Earth. I'd spent the previous 17 years exploring in this region around southern Africa and other parts of the world and had found just a few tiny scraps, just a few little pieces of these very rare objects. I mean, it's fair to say that the, the field of science that uh, Shara and I are in uh, is, is one of an unusual one where there are probably more scientists then there are fossils that we actually discover. And that creates a very strange environment to work in, where there's often a lot of competition to both work on these fossils, and there's a lot of drive to actually find these fossils. That led me to want to explore, want to find more. I was attracted by the odds of finding things that were almost lottery level uh, sort of discoveries to be made. And they certainly was, by the time I reached 2008, was proving to be true. It was, it was that hard to find. Uh, they were changing our entire institute at that time. And what then happened was that I began to discover other methods of looking. In December of 2007, I became probably the last human being on Earth to discover Google Earth. And with that, that power of having this high resolution technology. And that led me to then go out in the field and look for more of these sites. I chose to work in an area that's probably the most explored on the planet, this area just outside of Johannesburg called the Cradle of Humankind. And it was in August of that year, August 1st, in fact, that I stumbled into the site of Malapa. Fifteen days later, I would go back with my then nine-year-old son, Matthew. He used to go with me exploring. So did my daughter, Megan, out into the bush, always with my dog, Tao, who you saw in a picture earlier. And we would just roam these areas. We got back to the site. I said, OK, you know, go find fossils. Let's see what the site has to offer. A minute and a half later, he said, Dad, I found a fossil. <laughs> and I almost didn't go look, because I knew what he'd found. He'd found an antelope fossil. Because for every one of these early human fossils in southern Africa, where I work, even a tiny fragment, a single tooth, we find about 250,000 antelope fossils. But wow. he's my nine-year-old son, and you want to sort of encourage fossil hunting. And then I walked over, and five meters away, I saw this clavicle. Uh, what was remarkable about that was clavicles, of course, are highly identifiable uh, in primates, but I'd done my PhD on that bone. I was probably the world's expert on that bone I was looking at. Uh, I turned the rock over, and there was more. That would start this adventure uh, that I've been uh, undertaking. We named the new species in 2010, Australopithecus sediba. 
Um, it became a huge science project, uh, over 100 collaborators around the world, a lot of papers published in journals. That, uh, But I really did think that was it. I thought that was going to be my great moment of discovery, because they don't happen to you in this field. You know, you don't get a chance to make huge discoveries like that more than once. And so I quit looking. I actually stayed in the laboratory working on this treasure. It was only when I got shut out of the field um, because we were building this laboratory over the site because of the organic material and such that was found at the site of Malapa that I decided to go back out and begin exploring again. I found a team that could go underground, start working in the subterranean environments, and within a month, we hit. Um, what I thought was a skeleton of an early or a primitive hominid line on a floor, that would start that expedition that you saw, which a, a 60 person expedition I launched in November 2013 called the Rising Star Expedition. Within two days, we realized that something extraordinary was happening. I was wrong, it wasn't a skeleton. It was a lot of skeletons. By the end of the week, we discovered more fossils in this chamber of, of, of human ancestors than in the richest site ever discovered on the continent of Africa. Within 21 days, we had more fossils from that chamber than had been discovered in the entire history of the search for human origins in Southern Africa from one site. And as I said in the video, um, I don't remember when I said that, the, but the idea that now not, don't stop exploring, because Malapa wasn't a miracle. The Rising Star site showed us that there are other sites to be found going back out again, keeping teams in the field. And there are teams in the field, as you noted, Cheryl, right now, we are making other discoveries. We are going to be on the verge of the greatest age of discovery and exploration in the history of the search for human origins. These are not the rarest sought after objects. They're in fact becoming pretty common. And that's exciting. It is. It is incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned um, uh, people going into these caves. Was it, did you have an idea about this cave to begin with, or, or how did you discover the first bone in this rising star expedition? The cave is, is really unusual. It sits right next to the best known sites in South Africa, the sites of Sturkfontein and Swarkrams. Those sites have been known since the 1930s. Uh, this is right across the road from, and, and in fact was probably the best known site and best known cave in Southern Africa. It's where all the amateurs in Southern Africa have been training for the past 50 years. Everyone had been inside of it. So everyone knew there was nothing left to find. I sent my team in, and they went off the map. They went down a seven and a half inch slot that was <laughs> a seven and a half inch slot that was 120 feet underground, down a, a almost 40 foot shaft, entered this chamber, and there lying on the surface were these skeletons. Extraordinary. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you. Well, I think we're going to open up to some questions. Sure. Is that all right? Um, so uh, let's start with a student from the Bronx Center for Science and Math, uh, Mathematics. Sorry, Stephanie. I have two questions. One of them you maybe sort of answered. Where are the fossils you are covering found mostly in? Sorry, say it again. Where are the fossils you are uncovering found mostly in? OK, so most of the fossils where I've concentrated in the last six years, at least, uh, are in dolomitic limestone caves. Now, these dolomites are the, uh, are the remains of ancient seabeds. And they're a limestone, just like you would have in North America and other parts of the world. Caves form along fault lines within them. Some of the caves are big and open, and some of them are these little narrow chutes and shafts. So, most of the work in the last, say, uh, two years has been underground in these really extreme environments. And then prior to that, I'd been working on eroded caves, caves that were on the surface, like Malapa. That was where we traditionally thought the fossils would be in South Africa. Um, even prior to that, I've worked all over. I've worked on uh, lacustrine or lake sites and river sites, where they're on the surface across Africa. I've even worked in caves in Palau and Micronesia, or caves in China and, and Nanning. But largely, my expertise has, has drifted towards working in cave environments. Um, do you think that these fossils that correlate with other fossils from other locations support the idea of Pangea? That is a great question. And uh, the answer is yes, that's what we do. We try to examine the anatomy, 
the physical features of these from the teeth down to every part of the bone and compare it to other discoveries to understand their relationship. We use a big word called phylogenetic relationship or just looking at how things are related to each other. And the vast majority of people in our field um, tend to concentrate on the study of comparative anatomy so that we can understand relationships and how things evolved over time. Super, thank you. thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Diana from the High School for Environmental Studies. My question is, how were the scientists able to determine the gender of the specimen if only the facial fossils were recovered? That's a great question, and sometimes it can be very difficult. Um, the idea in, in sort of fossil species that we have would be that, that if you have large ones and small ones, there might be markers of robusticity. Males always tend to be more robust. They have stronger muscle markings. They often are bigger, although that's not always true. So sometimes it's just an assumption. So when you're only using um, skulls or dentition, it can sometimes be very, very difficult, particularly as we move more towards modern humans, to actually tell who's a male and who's a female, unless you have a sample. And that's why these new discoveries, I think, are so important. The idea that we're finding samples for the first time. Once you've got a sample, it's generally pretty easy to separate males and females based on, upon those kind of characters. Of course, you were right in asking about only the head. Largely in the past, we've been constrained to only working with dentition and skulls. That's changing rapidly. As we find these new skeletons, and parts of the body, we're able to look over the whole of the anatomy and start telling males from females. So for example, at Malapa, we actually have a male and a female. And interestingly, even though they have very small heads, we see differences in, for the example, the pelvis. The pel pelvis of females is wider and broader, so they can give birth. And in fact, those same, um, those same physical features are seen in Australopithecus sediba. So there, it's pretty easy. But you're right, it's a tough thing when you're only dealing with heads and teeth. Uh, my next question is, once the fossils were discovered, what was the process of testing the samples, preserving the bones, and studying the specimens? Okay, so the, there's a whole process that goes about once you have the, the discovery, and it depends on the situation. At Malapa, we have a different problem than we have at Rising Star. At Malapa, the fossils are encased in solid rock. They're two million years old. It's hard, hard rock. That has to be prepared. So that skull that you saw of Sediba took about... 15,000 person hours just to get the rock removed, very carefully working under microscopes with these little micro jack type drills that, that we use. We also use scanning and uh, CT scans to actually look inside of the rock and use virtual reconstruction. So that's the first phase, get the thing out. Then a process of analysis goes. Sometimes the fossils are not in great condition and they have to be preserved. So you might use consolidated, uh, consolidating glues that don't harm the fossils that might help us preserve it. Or sometimes they're solid rock. They're very hard and, and very dense. Or sometimes they're just like bone. And so it goes through a process of preservation. Then we go through a process of analysis. And that can be good old fashioned scientists just looking at them or measuring them with calipers, or sometimes taking three-dimensional images of them using different types of surface scanners or internal uh, scanners. Because in our field, often we think of just one scientist, but we have super specialized scientists. So that's why right now, between my two sites, there are over 160 different scientists working on it. And you might ask, how can you have 160 scientists working on something? That's because each one is a specialist. And they're working on a particular area, like Shara works on dentition related to feeding or our diet and behavior. And so she would be concentrating on that, while another person might look at something like only the distal humerus, the distal arm bone. And those specialists then combine that knowledge to get a whole picture of the life or lifestyles of these early hominids that we find. Super. One thing I was explaining to, um, we had, the, we had a, a lab visitation day earlier this week. Uh, we were talking about forensic anthropology and how you understand um, human variation. And one of the points, and I'm sure you agree with this, is a, a, a human uh, paleontologist um, can't just rely on the fossils or the bones in front of them. They study for a long time, right? The comparative anatomy, I'm sure you study comparative anatomy right. of apes and monkeys and, and things that might be similar, right, to That's get right. 
some kind of yardstick against which we measure That's right. You, you, we're not just examining these fossils and comparing them to other fossils. We have to understand the range of variation of all living animals as well that might be closely related to these. So we can understand the sort of differences that, say, chimpanzees have with each other, or chimpanzees have with bonobos, a closely related species, often called the pygmy chimpanzee, or that chimpanzees have with gorillas that have with modern humans. And it's looking at that range of variation that allows us to start establishing the differences. I think my mic just, there, there it is. Um, that starts establishing the differences between um, these different uh, populations that we find, and then their differences between other species. All right, well, next up we have somebody from your high school. Ah, Scranton um, County High School yes. in Sylvania, Georgia. <laughs> Shannon Kay. <laughs> <laughs> Is she asking? Okay. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much, and uh, say hi to everyone in Sylvania for me. Um, the Sylvania is a tiny little town in rural Georgia. Uh, the, the food was found in Sediba's teeth almost by accident. A, actually, when we, I was removing rock, or one of my preparatives was re removing rock, we realized there was a space around the teeth, and then we noticed there was staining on the teeth, and we couldn't figure out why that staining was there. But of course, it was obvious after we saw it, it was calculus and tartar. The same stuff that we get if you don't brush your teeth. Well, of course, they weren't brushing their teeth uh, two million years ago. And we analyzed inside of that calculus and tartar, and we found the remains of plants in the form of little phytoliths, or, or particles that were part of the support structure of plants. And there were some normal things you would think that a human or a human ancestor uh, would actually eat in the teeth of, of Sediba. There were things like palms. Palms, it was clear that they were eating um, palm fruits, and that meant there were palm trees around there. They were also eating quite a few seeds and nuts and things like that They were obvious. I think what was most surprising, or at least unexpected, was that their teeth were full of the remains of bark as well. So in at least part of Sadiba's life, at least the little boy, he was struggling because bark is a fallback food. Bark is often what primates go to when things are really, really bad. And it's actually very common. Even humans do it today. If things are really, really bad, they peel off the bark and they eat it. And it, it turns out that they were doing that too, which was kind of an interesting find and something that was quite surprising for me. Glad we don't have to eat bark. <laughs> <laughs> don't knock it till you try it. It's, it's pretty uh, amazing, too, that um, uh, hominids this long ago who weren't brushing their teeth don't end up with cavities, isn't it? And, and that's because they didn't have a high sugar intake. Right. So we almost never see cavities in any of these early, early hominids. We do see pathologies, you know, uh, aberrations of the teeth, generally related to non-eruption of the teeth, mm -hmm. but almost never cavities. Yeah. All right, next up we have Muhammad from Brooklyn Latin. So you study human origins and how, you know, how, how humans today became who they are. Um, so you know the final end product of this evolution, like the human anatomy, the modern human anatomy. Um, how does knowing that help you um, hypothesize about, the, about past humans, and how does it help you with your, in your discovery of human origins? That is a great question, Muhammad. Uh, the idea of understanding human anatomy and how it would relate to earlier humans and be predictive in evolutionary biology is really neat. And we often use things called primitive and derived characters. Uh, derived characters are things that, for example, we only find in modern humans. So those are characters that are unique to us that are, are found today. So like our large sort of grassle or softly built skull is relatively unique to, to humans. When we go back in time, we can start seeing how that becomes more and more primitive. And what I mean by primitive is moving towards the presumed ape ancestors. We know that we are very, very closely related to things like chimpanzees. We share in excess of 98% of our uh, genetic identity with them. So that while they're not a perfect model for an ancestor, they at least represent what they share, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, hylobatids, other apes, what they share could be 
retained primitive characters. So we might look at the difference between what has happened in the primitive forms and what happens in the derived forms, and we can watch that transgression through time through the fossil record or even through the genetic record. Sometimes we see in modern humans things like retained primitive characters, like, for example, our relatively long thumb and shortened features that we see going all the way back deep into the hominid fossil record until it's eventually lost into the longer fingered idea. So we tend to look at these primitive characters and derived characters that we as modern humans share, and then we watch them disappear or appear, depending on which one we look at, going back in the fossil record. And that's why the fossil record is so important, because not only does it, uh, it tell us about when those characters arrive, but it can often tell us about why they evolved. Now, a hominin can have a, a mosaic of primitive and derived characteristics, can't they? Yeah, in fact, Sadiba is probably one of the best examples found to date of that. And what Shara means about having primitive and derived characters, it means that some parts of the body might retain something that is very, very ancient in our lineage, and some parts might be surprisingly advanced. What Sadiba perhaps showed better than almost any discovery that had been made to date was that that can occur across the body, and we don't necessarily know the mode and tempo of when those primitive features vanish and when derived features appeared. And in fact, we've probably been wrong a lot about a lot of those ideas based upon looking at a fragmentary fossil record. Right. Okay, joining us remotely again from Vesemerland's gymnasium is Signa and Karsten. I hope. Why, hello. There, there's a body standing there, <laughs> <laughs> or at least part of one. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to, I have the question in front of me. Is it okay sure. if I read it? Because we're having a hard yeah. time. Okay, great. So the, the question is, a Danish museum uh, has made this reconstruction of Australopithecus sediba. How much do you believe this sculpture depicts reality? That's great. That, that sculpture is by the Kennis brothers, by the way. Um, and I think that it probably ref reflects a great deal of reality. Uh, what we did is working with uh, those particular paleo artists. They're people who take um, forensic studies of apes and humans, and they use it to do uh, muscle size and skin thickness and things like that to come up with a recreation of the skeletons in the past. We actually provided them with an entire skeleton of Sediba so that they could actually build that model around it. So from a physical point of view, that is the physical structures, the shape of the body, the length of the arms, the length of the legs, the shape of the foot, hands, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's probably a very accurate uh, prediction. The face is probably very accurate. The one area that we have to guess, because there are no markers left on the bony anatomy, are things like the nose, because the nose has to be sort of guessed uh, for its shape and size, but the rest of it's probably pretty good. You're probably looking at a pretty good look at the face of what we call Carabo, which is uh, the, the young boy that Matthew initially found. Things like skin color and uh, hair distribution pattern, at this stage, those are pure guesses at this point. And they're based upon the idea of whether these are closer to humans or apes. I can tell you, though, that in the near future, particularly even for that individual, that we won't have to be guessing so much because we've actually found what we think is fossilized skin and potentially fossilized hair. Can you believe it? Two million years. And with modern technology, we may be able to get things like skin color out of that and even hair color and hair distribution. Awesome. I visited, it is. Awesome. It is. And I, I, I visited Lee, um, what was it, last January, mm -hmm. I think? Uh, and I got to stand next to the skeletal reconstruction. And Sadiba is, is only about, is about the size of my six year old, right? That's right. About up to here. When do, when do human ancestors get tall like we are? Well, uh, human ancestors uh, get towards human height, uh, as far as the record tells us right now, uh, at about the time of Homo erectus. We see the first ideas of a taller, more modern human size, uh, dating so far again to about 
million years, it appears, we begin to reach into still small body, but human stature. The true sort of human stature, the kind of large uh, bodied individuals, we start picking up little signals of that a few hundred thousand years ago. Uh, but again, the record's very poor. We need better specimens to understand when those kind of events. And it's probably tied to things like long distance walking. Right. That is the lengthening of the legs, because if you're taller and, you ask, and have longer legs, you can move further, faster, more efficiently. OK, so we have uh, uh, Charles from the Bronx Center for Science and Mathematics. Um. <laughs> so my question was you're a good you, example of a tall human right <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think the study benefits the world okay well how does the study of human origins benefit the world that's a, that's a really good question because some people might say well it's just like studying dinosaurs or just like studying anything well those are very valuable because they help us understand how the processes of evolution have occurred often how extinction has occurred because um, we need to understand the processes that, that have eliminated species as much as we need to understand what have allowed certain species to survive. So in a general sense, paleontology, I think, is very important in general to understanding our present world. The past is, in fact, key to the present in that way. More importantly, though, paleoanthropology. Well, we are probably the dominant species of animal on this planet right now. We may not be the most numerous, but we are certainly probably the dominant. We're probably also the most dangerous, not only to each other, but to this planet uh, itself. And you know what we're doing is understanding the origins of those behaviors and, and, and who we are. For example, how many people in this audience uh, want to know who their grandparents were or their great-grandparents? Uh, who's ever looked into your own past? Most of you have, right? Why do you do that? Because the reason you do it may seem just out of interest, but it's also to learn a little bit about yourself, because we all have this inbred knowledge that those people in the past have given us something. Maybe it's your hair color. Maybe it's your nose. Maybe it's the, your height. It could be many, many things. But you want to know because you want to understand where those traits came from. Well, that's what paleoanthropology is doing in deep time, it's just doing it for our whole species. And that's really important if we want to understand this incredible, wonderful species that occupies everywhere on the planet, but is also an incredibly dangerous species, not only to our own species, but to every other thing that shares this world with us. Do you know how much Neanderthal DNA you have? I do. <laughs> Am I allowed to Can say? Can you share it? <laughs> I have 3.7% Neanderthal that's above DNA. Average. Yes, I am. I know. Wow. It explains a lot, doesn't yes, it? Yes, I wasn't going to say that, <laughs> but okay. Um, you can all go to, uh, I shouldn't do a plug for 23andMe, uh, if you want to find out how much Neanderthal DNA you have, um, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, next, uh, Leslie from the High School for Environmental Studies has two questions for you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my first question is, what is the procedure for preserving a newly discovered fossil? Okay, that again depends on how the uh, fossil is preserved. So sometimes it's very easy. They're, they're stone, they're hard. They literally are a form of rock. They've been replaced by other material. In that case, often we do nothing. We just have it. It's like having a, a rock collection, if you will. Sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes these fossils are devastatingly bad. They are, have been waterlogged or they've broken down because they've eroded out of uh, the ground. And so then we have to use a variety of preservatives that consolidate the fossil. It's often a glue. We use things like Paraloid or Butvar 76. And these, are, these are special glues that we can identify the chemistry of. So when we're doing other types of tests, that they don't damage them. So sometimes it's that. And sometimes the fossils are so fragile that we can't actually handle or touch them at all. And so then what we have to use is CT scans, so x-rays, and often very, very fine ones on micro CTs to scan them and then one by one put them back together in a virtual world. So that's something, though, that we've only been able to do in the last few years. The technology is changing all the time. There will come a stage when we never have to prepare or touch a fossil again. It'll only be by choice uh, because the, the virtual technology is becoming so dominant. 
Um, my second question is, what are the characteristics of the discovered fossils that help you identify the time period it was from? That's a good question, too. Now, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Shara <laughs> uh, and I were talking about that before. There's often a mistake of people using morphology or the physical appearance of an animal to tell you how old it is. That's a very dangerous thing to do, unless you have a very, very good record of the past. Because things, when we find a fossil, that, and, and we call it a new species, let's say Sediba at 2 million, that's certainly not the first occurrence of that species, nor is it the last occurrence of that species. Those things could go way down in time. Uh, you would all probably know of things like the coelacanth, right? The coelacanth is a, an ancient fish that is alive today. But any time a ichthyologist would find a coelacanth, you would know this is an ancient fish from its morphology. Its fossils go back 250 million years or more. And yet, by looking at its morphology, even a living animal, you know it has a deep time. But you would never know, and never should you, try to place that in time, because it could be any time between 250 million, its first occurrence, say, and the present. So that's a dangerous thing to do that we shouldn't really do, although it's really tempting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Those are sure. excellent questions. Um, we're going to go back to your uh, former high school. Back to Scriven uh, County High? Yep, to I'll Darius plug that. D. Go Gamecocks. <laughs> 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 hey. Sorry, I, I, could you repeat that question? Are you ever shot for how the mind has developed over here? How the mind has developed? Human mind has developed. How the human mind has developed. That's one of the coolest questions that there is in uh, human origins, the idea of how did we get this incredibly complex mind. We can look at things like our closest living relative, chimpanzees. We can see that they use tools. They manufacture tools often. But there is perfectly honestly something very different about humans. It's clear that we are incredibly more complex than that. That's one of the great driving questions. And I would suggest one of the great driving questions of the future is when, how, and where did that complexity arrive. As the story goes right now, we think that the modern human mind, and now I don't mean the physical mind, I mean the way we think, probably emerged around 100 to 150,000 years ago. And we do that not by looking at the brain itself, but by looking at behaviors that come along with it, like burial of the dead, or like the creation of art, or creation of self-adornment, which we're using as signals to say that this change that makes us this incredibly, apparently unique animal is beginning to occur in the archaeological record. Sometimes also we study the morphology of the external part of the brain uh, in these fossils. Now you might ask, how can you study a fossil brain that's two million years old? Well, it's actually pretty easy because inside of your skull, as you were growing, your brain with every one of your heartbeat was pounding out an image of itself on the inside of your skull. When we find a skull, we can fill it either physically with things like molding material, or today, virtually, we can actually excavate that, what we call an endocast out, and we can look at the sulcian gyri, the, uh, the convolutions of the brain of the external surface, and see whether perhaps complexity is arising. We have areas of our brain that show up on the surface that are more complex than, say, chimpanzees or gorillas or other apes. And so that also allows us to at least get a tiny look at when complexity arises in the past. The answer is, though, I would not hold on to the way we think those things have come for very long. I think all these new discoveries are giving us big, dis big surprises about when and where and how human complexity has arisen and human brain complexity has arisen. Right. Yeah, we make a big deal out of our big brains, and we often think it's associated with being super smart. How would we compare, how would you compare our brains to that of Australopithecus sediba? Well, and, and the interesting part is that, you know, it, it was thought for forever and ever that that was the trick. Whenever we got big brains, that was the trick that made us different. Uh, new discoveries, though, are showing that perhaps that's not so true. 
that maybe the big brain is just a byproduct of something else. Because we're seeing levels of complexity in smaller brains. So for example, um, Sadiba's brain is, is about 450 cubic centimeters. Well, that's about the size of my fist right here, right? About the size of an orange, if you imagine that. But we're seeing markers that appear to suggest that there is greater complexity in the brain of Sadiba than we ever thought possible for something with a brain that small. And that may mean that some of the things that we associate, behaviors like language and other things like that, may have much deeper roots in time than previously thought. I'd watch that space. <laughs> All right, let's go to Joseph from Brooklyn Latin. My question is, just as um, you've discovered the stuff from um, the most, your most important find in Africa, basically finding about, um, I think, six skeletons, do you think that there, is any, there are any other places that could be just as productive as Africa in finding those things? That's a great question. Well, firstly, let's talk about Africa a little bit. You know, people thought that Malapa was a miracle, that, that you know, nowhere would you find anything. The Rising Star thing says, Malapa is not a, a miracle. And I can tell you a little secret if you promise not to tell anyone. And that is, that is that there are a lot more things like that to be discovered. Our teams are making new discoveries across southern Africa right now uh, in surprising locations that are equal to these kind of discoveries. They're not miracles. That brings up the real part of your question. Is it just Africa or is it elsewhere? Well, firstly, the evidence to date says it's probably Africa for the early part of, of this. Africa, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that Africa just had the raw materials. It had apes in it. And since we're related to apes, we needed apes to evolve from that. But there's another reason for that, too, that we often don't think of. Africa is huge. Africa represents something like a third of the habitable landmass of this planet. One third. You can take the habitable landmass, and you should go. They, there are actually things on, online that you can actually see this done. But you can stick the habitable landmass of South America, North America, Europe, and Asia inside the continent of Africa. And very few people realize that. So at any one time, if you take the new world out, that is South America and North America, because the apes weren't there and they couldn't get there until much later in this story, at any one time in the past, if you were just looking, and you can take Australia out for the same reason, they couldn't get there. Um, if you're looking at just Europe, Africa, and Asia, if you threw an ice age in there and let those ice sheets come right down to the edge of the Mediterranean, as they have in the past, there's nowhere else for uh, human ancestors to be except on the continent of Africa until they were capable of moving into those environments. Having said that, we need to be exploring everywhere. Uh, things like Rising Star Malapa and other finds that are coming out tell us we need more explorers. We've done a great job of training generations of scientists to sit in laboratories analyzing things or sit behind your computer and analyzing things. What these discoveries are saying is that we should have no preconceptions about what there is that's out there to be found. And we need your generation to get out from behind those computers and start exploring these areas even where we think we know what the story is. Exploring Europe, exploring Asia, exploring North America, exploring South America, exploring your own backyards. I mean, for goodness sake, Malapa was sitting in the most explored area on planet Earth for hominid fossils, and it was so easy to find a nine-year-old could do it. <laughs> and we had all missed it. Now, the answer is, I don't know the answer to your question. You need to get out there. All of you need to get out there and start exploring in the real world because there are things to be discovered that we don't know about. Yeah, not only in Africa, but uh, in, in terms of uh, human evolution in my time period, right? Uh, modern human origins and Neanderthals, the Near East, and also Central Asia. It's a big empty spot that we really need people to go in and and, and discoveries like Dimonisi in Georgia right. mm -hmm. are arguing that there may have been even earlier migrations and of course things like the Flores Hobbit. This is this little tiny uh, humanoid type creature that was discovered. There's huge debate about on the island of Flores, but may have been sitting right in front of us on that island for a very, very long time, and we didn't know about it until just a few years ago. Yeah. There are wonderful things to be found. We just can't put blinkers in about exploration. So true, so true. All right, let's go remotely again to the Vestimerlands Gymnasium, to Signe. Hi, 
I love Sadiba sitting right in front of that. <laughs> Half a Sadiba. Hi. Uh, what, what is the chance for new hominin species to evolve? What is the chance for a new hominin species to evolve? That is a super question. Then I'll let Shara answer. No, I'm a, <laughs> That's all you, Lee. That's all you. Um, I think that it is highly unlikely that a new bipedal ape will evolve out of Homo sapiens under the present conditions. Um, because, to be blunt, we are basically able to share our genes across the world. You can be sharing your genes in New York today and Hong Kong tomorrow and Africa the day after that and Australia. And by doing that, we are actually homogenizing the, the, the genetics and the morphology of humans by spreading those genes. I tend to think you would want to have isolation. And it's hard for me to imagine, short of a catastrophic event like a giant meteor striking the planet that would isolate humans from each other. And even then, because technology exists, even if something hugely catastrophic we're basically spread over every part of this planet. It would have to almost destroy this planet. However, there is one area where, where that might happen. And that, I would suggest, is space travel. Because if we sent a colony of people out, or just their DNA, out so that somehow they could escape Earth and be isolated for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps, um, in another environment, then it is very possible that through things like founder effect and through mutations that might occur due to radiation in whatever environment they found themselves, that, that something that they would look and be very different from us over a very long time. But that's real Star Trek stuff. Um, but, but I think probably right now, that's about the only way we would get a new species, unless we breed one. And that is that we use DNA and we use paleo DNA to attempt to replicate or bring some of these back in the way that there's conversation about doing that with mammoths and things like that. And technically, that would probably be a new species. The ethics of that are a different question, but it certainly is probably in the not distant future capabilities of humans with things like Neanderthals. Yes, yes. I remember hearing about a woman who volunteered to be the first one to have be, a baby yes. Neanderthal. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't me. Brave lady. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would agree with you about space travel. That's my kind of stock answer, too. All right, so let's go to Bronx Center for Science and Math. Um, Safiatu? My question was, since Africa is a really large landmass, why did you choose specifically South Africa? Why did I choose South Africa? Well, when I was a, a young paleoanthropologist wannabe, I actually went to East Africa to start, because that's where all the action was. Um, but I wanted to find fossils in, in the field. And unfortunately, at that time, we're talking about the late 1980s, uh, East Africa was pretty full of young, aggressive scientists who were all looking for fossils, too. And there wasn't a lot of space South for a young person like me to get into it. I really didn't want to end up in the laboratory. I wanted to be out there finding fossils. South Africa had kind of closed down. Apartheid had shut it down for good reason. The science had been very limited there. There hadn't been a new fossil hominid discovery uh, of a new site in 48 years when I arrived there. The la that was the last time. Um, I started going out into the caves immediately because I saw opportunity. I thought there must be something else. And within a year of being there, I found the first new early hominid site in 48 years, a site called Gladys Vale. That got me hooked. And then I spent the next six 17 years finding bits and pieces, <laughs> little tiny fragments, until Matthew said, dead, I found a fossil. And that changed it. So South Africa was uh, open turf that had a history. Um, I now think that's the wrong idea. You shouldn't just look where people have found other things. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We need to go out into the rest of Africa, and in fact, the rest of the world, as we were saying earlier, and go to these places where people say there aren't any fossils. Because you know what I bet? I bet they're there. Thank you. Of course, if you want to get money to do that, you need to have some reason to, <laughs> to get in there. You know, right? that's a huge problem. Yeah. One of the problems that Char is, is talking about is these things cost money. They cost resources to actually go out and, and find fossils. 
And one of the problems is funding agencies often won't fund exploration. They want you to have made the discovery before they will fund you to make the discovery, believe it or not. And so what we need to do is change that attitude. We need what I often call blue sky exploration. We need the idea that people, young people, old people, people with good ideas for sound reasons that want to go and explore an area should be able to get the resources to do it. Because it's actually very rare to find people who are willing to take risks. And I can tell you this, great science and great discoveries are not made by chance. They're made by taking risk, calculated risk, but risk. It's just like surfing. You don't surf a great wave behind the wave. You do it at the front of the wave. And of course, you're always at risk of being knocked off if you're there. But that's the kind of thing we need. We need good, calculated risk takers, and we need your generation to do it. Great. OK, Simon from High School for Environmental Studies. Uh, my question is, what exactly do fossils teach you about human interaction in the past? What do the fossils we find teach us about human interactions in the past? Yes. Yeah, the, that's a great question. Now, often the fossils are so fragmentary that we find that it's very difficult to tell not only how they were interacting in the past with their environment, but how they were interacting with others of their own species because we don't have any samples of others of their own species. That's changing because of the numbers of fossils we have. But one of the things that we do is we have to look at the whole of the environment. We have to actually understand the world they lived in. So it may sound like our conversation has been all about only finding hominid or human ancestor fossils. But actually, equally, if not more important, are finding the fossils of all the other animals and the plants that represent the world they lived in. Because that world is the one that they would have interacted with, and it would have driven them it would have created stresses and had stressors that actually caused evolution to occur. And so a lot of what we do is looking at the world they lived in, even in the absence of their fossils. Because sometimes you know they're there even when you haven't found them, when you find things like tools or things like that. So that is a big, big part of what we do. How certain species like Sadiba, if you want to focus in on that, it's clear that, for example, Sadiba was climbing something now, sometimes we would traditionally say trees, but there are more things to climb in the world than trees, uh, than just trees. But it was clearly climbing something. It's clear that they had lowered some of their sexual dimorphism. What that means is the body size difference between males and females was lowered. And we're immediately beginning, when you see something like that, to learn about their social behavior. Why do males become more the size of females? Well, that's generally because they're becoming more peaceful, intraspecifically. That is, within their own species. You're lowering violence. Um, you're lowering the level of dominance within it. So it's not such a patriarchal thing like a gorilla group where the males are much bigger than the females. So we can use things like that even to signal um, uh, things about behavior. And in fact, there are tons of specialties of science that do just that. Thank you. Now, I know as early as uh, 800,000 years ago, we have cut marks on human bones, which tell us they weren't always acting so nicely to each other. Uh, <laughs> That's now, right. you don't get anything like that as early as Sadiba do. Um, not yet. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the idea that uh, violent interaction uh, has occurred is, is probable. I mean, chimpanzees are very, very violent uh, and are warlike in some cases. But humans tend to be less violent. It, it might surprise people if I said, uh, it, Name for me the most peaceful animal on the planet. You say rabbits, you say what? Elephants and stuff. I'd actually say it's humans. I'd say humans are the most peaceful animal on the planet. Don't mistake the application of technology and the ability to kill large number of people um, with the will to do so. Human society punishes individuals who do that. We don't see it as a good thing. And probably that's been our character into the deep past. You think it's weird, but just look in this room. Here we have, uh, and look in those classrooms that are, are around the world. Um, in this classroom, we put a whole bunch of breeding age males and females together that are not related to each other into an enclosed environment. We've actually packed it. And yet you're not ripping each other's throats out. If you did that, even with domestic animals, 
like rabbits or cows or other things like that, or, and let me warn you on this, our closest relative, the chimpanzees. If you did this kind of experiment, this room would be a bloodbath. We control that instinct as a very deep part of our nature. That's, that's such an optimistic way to look at humans. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, OK, we're going to go back to, um, to your high school, to Scrubbing County. Go Gamecocks again. <laughs> to... <laughs> Savannah. Good morning, Dr. Berger. Good morning, Good morning Savannah. Sean. Good morning. I'm actually Kirsten. Oh. Oh, great question. What was my scariest moment? Um, about a year ago, uh, we entered another part of the Rising Star Chamber uh, where my teams had found something that you'll hear about next year. And uh, it was pretty difficult to get to. It involved squeezing through about nine inch uh, sort of uh, areas down about 200 feet under, underground, squeezing through these areas. And it was easy enough for me to get down with my team in that because gravity was working with me. Getting up is a different matter because I had to slide up into a slot and turn sideways. That was easy to get my legs down, but now you had to come out that way. And there was nowhere to put your uh, feet. And I ended up getting wedged into that slot for an hour and a half, and being stuck underground with millions of tons of rock pressing on your chest, because you have to exhale as you push through this, and then of course you can't breathe out all the way once you stick. Um, eventually, you know, there is a rule in caving like this, it's first very dangerous. If one of those rocks slips a little bit, you die instantly. But there's a rule in caving, if you can get into a place, you can get out of a place. You just have to be calm and work your way out. And the way that they eventually got me out, and I say they got me out because I did very little to get myself out, was <laughs> I eventually could get both of my arms above my head, and they could strap a rope to my wrists and literally pull me, almost delivering me through this, this area, almost dislocating my shoulders and, and get me out of this little slot. That was, that was pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't pay me. <laughs> you couldn't pay me enough to do it. Wow. Um, OK, we're going to move quickly on to Brooklyn Latin, because I don't want to talk about caves anymore. Uh, Shamiana. What do you think are some of the more uh, major controversies, uh, controversies in your field? I think that the biggest uh, uh, controversies that are in our field at this time are uh, how localized were some of the important events that occurred in human origins? You know, was it an East Side story? Was all the important events occurring along in East Africa? Because that's, that's been kind of the idea we had. We thought it was being driven, in fact, by uh, plate tectonics and making a perfect environment. So that's one. I think where some of these things occurred. What I would suggest is we don't have any idea. That certainly new discoveries are arguing that lots of important things were happening around the continent of Africa, at least in the early part of this. The second area that I think are some of the things we've talked about a little bit. You know, what we're driving some of the big critical events, these what I often call sacred cows we have, encephalization, increasing brain size, or what was driving long distance walking and the emergence of the human lower leg, and when and where and why did that occur? Or did it occur a bunch of times? Was it multiple experiments going on? That's another area. Another area is how much interbreeding was there? We sort of tended to think about the world prior to genetics and prior to ancient DNA studies uh, in a sort of simplistic, linear matter. Even if we talked about bushes and trees, you know, it was this species begets this species begets this species, nice and clean. Well, now with DNA studies, we know we share a lot of, uh, well, some of us share a little, if not a lot, of DNA with Neanderthals. Uh, which means that that species boundary was not as rigid as we thought it was, and that they were able to, even after hundreds of thousands of years of separation, to interbreed. That's what means when you have shared DNA with a species like that. I think it's a really interesting question to how common that was in the past. 
You know, we can't just think of it probably as one isolated situation. And maybe there was a lot more interbreeding, a form of hybridizations that were occurring than we suspected before. But that's very controversial. All right, well, we have one last question Great. from the Vista Merlans Gymnasium from Cine. Super. Hello. Hello. What is the chance of finding a new hominin species? I guess. I think, without giving anything away, extraordinarily good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, those are all our questions. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share with the audience? I, I would just like to go back to what I was saying earlier, and that is that, you know, your generation has a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Never before have we been empowered to interact with the whole world in the way that your generation is. You have the power of, of collective mind. You can communicate with anyone uh, anywhere on this planet with no boundaries. You also have almost limitless technology. There's nothing that's not outside the potential that you can imagine that your generation either already isn't inventing or can invent. And that's going to give you tremendous, tremendous potential to be the greatest age of explorers in all of history. I know probably many of you, certainly I did when I was young, I thought that the great age of exploration was over. I thought the idea of exploration was, you know, sailing ships that went around the world and landing on islands where there weren't people or going to climbing new mountains or, or finding new animals that no one had thought was existed. It was probably a thing that was gone, that those ages were past 100, 200 years ago, and that if someone like me when I was a young person ever dreamed of getting into National Geographic magazine, that I'd probably have to climb up the south side of Everest naked with a dead parrot on my shoulder. And that, that would be like the only way you'd get attention in discovery or exploration. That would work. That's not true. What these discoveries that my colleagues and I have been involved in tell us that we haven't even begun to explore this planet and see its wonders and see what there is to be discovered. Yeah, we may have walked over practically every square inch of it, but we haven't understood what we were seeing and touching in that journey. Technology and your ability to communicate and instantly around the world gives you the advantage of making this the greatest age of exploration. But that comes with one caveat, one thing that holds it back, that while those computers and that technology may help you lead you to those discoveries, you got to actually get out from behind it and get out there in the field yourself. And that what I would like to leave you with is a message of be explorers. Be real explorers. Use technology. Use each other. Use communication. But get out there and find things. And don't just think you have to come to Africa to do it, or Asia, or remote Pacific islands. Look in your own backyard. Often the places you think you know the best are actually the places you know the least. Thank you very much.